Hi. In this very first edition of Peach Orchard Publishing's What They Saw, we'll be looking at the Battle of Monocacy, right outside my hometown of Frederick, Maryland. That took place July 9th, 1864. We're going to be watching it through the eyes of Alfred S. Rowe, Company A, 9th New York Heavy Artillery, United States Army. He wrote down his account in his book, Monocacy, published by F.S. Blanchard and Company in 1894. I'll be reading excerpts from his account while visiting the ground on which he fought. The locations are sometimes approximations. I'm not going to fact check his account, that's not really my place. I'm just presenting his first person account as he saw it and as he wrote it on the ground on which he stood and fought. Rowe begins his account, Monocacy. Napoleon dictating decrees in the city of Berlin is, to a Prussian, the most humiliating scene in the history of his country. It's parallel in March 1871 when the triumphant Germans, with Emperor William at their head, marched into fallen Paris, will ever bring a flush of shame to a Frenchman's face, and that Jubal A. Early in July 1864 did not write his dispatches to Lee, his chief, from the captured capital of the United States, was owing not so much to the care and providence of those in command as to the unquestioning obedience and bravery of those soldiers who for nine long hours, against fearful odds, held his host in check at Monocacy. Upon every mind, some scenes are indelibly marked, Time only deepens the impression. The more than thirty years that have intervened since we stood in battle array by the side of the Maryland River seem a mere matter of days, for, as in a kaleidoscope of events of that 9th of July 1864, follow each other in such clear-cut outlines, brilliant in color, yet blending into each other so symmetrically, so harmoniously, that we take no heed of the long years that have rolled away. From our individual standpoints, the field, with its moving characters, is clear as when the hills and trees first shut it from our view. It's true that we're not, on that occasion, studying pictures, nor did we think of ourselves as figuring in historic scenes. But the passing glances, and its intensity, took far more than the leisurely looking of less impressive occasions. Very few of us know the reasons that brought our sudden removal from the vicinity of Petersburg. We have to wait until the chief actors in this drama have disclosed their parts to know why just had we had our own respective cues. And so, Alfred Rowe comes to Monoxy from the trenches of Petersburg. So Alfred Rowe finds himself in Frederick, Maryland, attached to an army cobbled together by Lew Wallace, scapegoat at Shiloh, facing a much larger army led by Jubal Early, sent to take Washington, D.C., at a minimum, relieve pressure off of Robert E. Lee's army trapped in Petersburg, Virginia. Rowe continues. About the morning of the battle, he writes, The sun shines over us and lights up the fields to the westward. Active efforts are making to gather in the wheat, which is in shocks upon the hill, to the northward of the big farmhouse, where we learn that of Colonel C. K. Thomas. The Saturday was to behold two harvests from that field. The first we were watching as it was garnered, but the next was fall under a reaper we called death, and even then men, quick and exultant, were regarding the very places where ere long they were to lie prostrate, beyond the sowing and the reaping. The scene was beautiful. Around us swept the fields and trees, fair as a garden of the Lord, not alone to the eyes of the famished. Rebel hordes, but equally so to those loyal men and boys, just below is the railroad on which we came in from Baltimore the day before. There is the iron bridge across the river, and the rebels very much wish to destroy it. A little further along, and at our left, is the covered bridge on the Georgetown Pike. Our own men under orders will fire in that the afternoon, what a charming sight is the farmhouse of Colonel Thomas, and still further to the left and much nearer is the Gambrel Stone Mill, which must have a place in every memory. Time flies rapidly, and soon we move down to our left and join the other five companies, and for a few moments we in place rest. Intent on all that is passing, we are much interested in the movements of two young ladies, who to our eyes are as fair as angels. Obviously they are in distress over something, what, we can only surmise. Our last view of them is when they almost double quick across the railroad bridge. Whether successful or otherwise in their mission, we can only conjecture. But we realize that they move as if sent for, and when was beauty ever in distress that a man did not sympathize? 
Perhaps it's nine o'clock when we find ourselves in line along the Georgetown Pike and facing a fine rail fence with ends mortised into posts. We are ordered to lift this out and to leave it prone, a precaution for retreating that Grant was not wont to make. We advance almost to the brow of the hill, with our right near the river, and here we lie for several weary hours. We have no entrenching tools, but individually we throw up such defenses as the implements contained in our haversacks with bayonet aid can make. Some writers commenting on the battle have said that had we been able to construct serviceable breastworks, like those made all the way down from the rapid end to Petersburg, we might have held the rebels longer if we had not defeated them altogether. But all this is conjecture. We surely did not have the faculties. Rations are dealt out to us, and once, in regimental history, coffee and sugar go begging. The reason is not far to seek, for we're under fire, and the contingent which dreaded that element was smelling the battle afar, located in the edge of some woods, temporarily out of harm's way and well to the rear. Those same boxes of remnants excited rebel admiration when late in the afternoon we fell back and Johnny's advanced. It didn't matter that they were in battle line. They found time to scoop out all that we had left. General Sherman once said that an army moves on its belly, and our hungry foe lost no opportunity to put this maxim in practice. Everybody knows that they were horribly ill-fed. We have all told six small guns, but the rebels seem to have a whole pack of artillery and every piece is plain. The cornfield back of us becomes a veritable iron mine, and now and then a shell explodes unpleasantly near us. At our left is the 1st Brigade, and in this is the 14th New Jersey, to whose members this whole region is very familiar, since here they spent the first year of their enlistment. Their commander, Colonel Truix, heads the brigade today, and he it is who recommends to the family of Colonel Thomas the propriety of seeking refuge in the cellar while the fight is on, and there his people and the Gambrel family are while the battle rages. The house is pretty well torn up, but no non-combatant is injured. We hear more than we see of the fight at our right, where over the river Lieutenant Davis of the 10th Vermont is in command of the picket line. With him are a few hundred day men from Maryland, and our Company M with Captain A.S. Wood. That they are doing good work is evident from the continued firing. The rebels are too numerous, and the Federals retreat, some in our direction, and those nearest the railroad bridge over that. The hedge around the Thomas house and the wheat shocks beyond afford not exactly a protection to our men, but they do hide them a little. We plainly see the fighting here and only wonder when the call will come for us. It's strange. The memory is active in some of those boyish minds. Homes far away are in fancy, vividly seen, and one at least sings to himself the words of that song then so popular in many lonesome northern circles. Just before the battle, mother, I'm thinking most of you, while upon the field we're watching, with the enemy in view, comrades brave around me lying, filled with thoughts of home and God. For well we know that on the morrow some will sleep beneath the sod. Again and again we hear the rebel yell, and we see the lines of gray advance only to be driven back by the well-directed fire of our men. The afternoon is far advanced before we're ordered in. Any change from our cramped position is grateful. To us of Company A, Captain Hyde repeatedly says, Remember that you are the color company, an honor that carries with you its own compensation, for the flag is where the bullets are likely to be most numerous. However, we of A think that we fully realize a responsibility. Though our eyes are supposed to be well in front, it's not strange that we take a glance down the line, and I shall never forget how soldierly Colonel Seward sat his magnificent chestnut horse. No wonder that when the fight was over, General Wallace telegraphed, he behaved with rare gallantry. We advanced to the fence separating the wheat stubble from the growing corn just beyond. Into this we pour our fire, what a clipping greets our ears. Our old smoothbore muskets with canister loads make havoc in the rebel ranks, and I am asked many times afterwards what we loaded with. But General Wallace has discovered that there are endless lines of Confederates. He has succeeded in making the enemy show up his strength, and he realizes that we are not sufficient to effectively cope with him. He sees that the rebel right far outreaches our left, that our whole division is extended in a single line, 
of blue, and that he may at any moment sweep around us and capture the whole array. To crown all, a rebel force is seen creeping up the riverside and beyond our right, where the alert enemy has discovered a loophole. There are no men to be sent to head him off, and we must get out. But even then, we are told that brave Rickett refuses to go till he receives a written order. He was not used to leaving the battlefields in that way. Messages sent to recall the forces at our extreme left are shot down. So exposed is the way over which they must go. But finally, an orderly gets through and directs a retreat, if the same be possible. No one likes being whipped. And the falling back business was not altogether agreeable to many who retired along the way over which they had just advanced. Those who had watches were not consulting them then, so it would be difficult to tell how long we were occupied in getting back to our starting place. Many, however, do not return with us. For the field is dotted with the bodies of those who only a few moments before had drawn rations with us. Colonel Seward's horse has been shot under him, and in falling breaks his rider's leg. Two men are supporting the colonel as he orders his men, the ninth, to rally around their colors. Captain Harmon of Company H is standing well down towards the burning bridge, and he at least takes up the colonel's refrain. We remain here long enough to go out and pick up the two better muskets than those which my comrade Wheeler and myself are carrying. Lieutenant Colonel Taft, severely wounded, is lying under a tree at the left of our line, and Colonel Seward directs Lieutenant Colvin of Company H to go after him. With a squad of men, the lieutenant essays to obey, but before they can reach the officer, the rebel line has passed the tree under which he has fallen. We of A Company keep close to the colors, and I remember thinking that if I stuck to the flag, I couldn't be a great ways wrong. I recall the sergeant who bore the standard, saying with a strong German accent, "'Damn it, there's no use of staying here longer.' As we go around the great stone mill, a big colonel with his coat and vest unbuttoned is saying, Elevate your pieces, men. Who he is, I do not know. But in the light of subsequent information, I strongly suspect he was Colonel Henry of the 10th Vermont, one of the best officers in the field. From this point, confusion reigns. Several times, small squads of our soldiers turn about and give the advancing foe a salute. But settled resistance is at an end. We had retreated but a few rods from the fence before the line of Gree appeared through the corn, and the Confederates bear down upon us. There are enough of them to gobble us all if they can reach us. They have an abundance of artillery, and we are constantly reminded of its presence. Still, in our inexperience, many of us do not believe that the day is irretrievably lost. Somewhere, we expect to find a newly formed line, and that the advance of the enemy will be checked. Had we known what General Wallace knew, that there were thousands of rebels, where we had scarcely more than hundreds, and that the object for which the sacrifice had been made was attained, we'd have picked up our heels with a little more alacrity. We did not know that a part of our division had not been with us at all, but had been unnecessarily delayed at Monrovia the entire day. We did not know how strenuously Tyler and his 100 days men had been striving to hold the bridge on the Baltimore Pike, nor did we know how near early had come to bagging us all. I pass a comrade sitting by the roadside. Blood is trickling from a wound just below his heart. I had carried his gun the night before, and now I say goodbye to him. There's no fear, no regret in his tone as he replies. A brave country boy had lived, and death has no terrors for him. He could not have smiled more sweetly had he been lying down to pleasant dreams. Hours afterwards, I carry a canteen full of water to another comrade lying on a pile of grain in the storehouse by the railroad. And he too had no complaints, no repinings. He said only, I have my death wound, and with the dew of youth yet freshly upon him, with all the prospects of a long life ended, he closed his eyes in dreamless sleep. And so they died in the east and in the west, the young and the old, on the field amidst the roar of musketry and cannonading in the hospitals of wounds and fever, on the lonely picket line, as scouts and vedettes, and who records any regrets? They deem the cause worthy the sacrifice. Eyes grew dim in many a northern home for a singer dumb and gory. But he reckoned not. He was past all pain and sorrow. For him there was a burial near the place where he fell, and for the future his name upon the nation's deathless roll. 
but the burning of the Turnpike Bridge is thus described by a member of Company B. Colonel William H. Seward, Jr. received orders from General Wallace about 9 a.m. to detach two companies of a regiment for special duty. Colonel Seward immediately detached Company B by the following order. Lieutenant Fish, order your company in line and march them down to that bridge and hold it at all hazard. The order was promptly executed. The company prepared the best they could to defend the passage of the bridge. The rebels tried to shell the bridge, but with one exception, it was too low for their range. As the battle raged furiously, the lines changing front from the situation of the armies, it became evident the bridge would be burned. A hole was made through the east end of the roof. When the commanding officer ordered that the bridge be burned, Private Alvin N. Sova went up and set fire to the roof, which was wrapped in flames at once. It was impossible to rejoin the regiment at this time. The only way was to the rear, but Lieutenant Fish declined to move out without orders. Soon a field officer rode up and ordered him to move his company to the rear without delay. This he did, being urged forward by the rebel bullets from the rear. On intersecting the railroad, it was found that Lieutenant Burton and several men had been taken prisoners. On crossing the railroad, the situation seemed perilous, and to prevent the further reduction of his ranks, Lieutenant Fish gave this unique order. Sergeant Stafford, put the bayonet through the first damn man that attempts to leave the ranks. On reaching the woods and filing to the right, soon came out into open field and were intercepted by General Wallace on return from the stone bridge where he had been given orders to Colonel Brown. On nearing the company, the general asked, What troops are these? Lieutenant Fish replied, It's Company B of the 9th New York Heavy Artillery. General Wallace says, Lieutenant, it's no fault of your company, nor of the 9th New York Heavy Artillery Regiment, that this battle has been lost. Lieutenant Fish replied, I trust not, sir. On starting to leave the company, General Wallace remarked, Lieutenant Fish, I certainly will remember you in my report, and rode away rapidly. Referring to the foregoing incident in a personal letter to Captain Davis of the 10th Vermont, who commanded the skirmish line, General Wallace says, It had to go, and what was worse, it had to go leaving Davis and his whole detachment cut off unless they could swim the river under close fire. I rode to see the order executed. Ricketts' line was engaged from wing to wing. Nearly thirty years have passed, yes, I remember as if it were yesterday, the struggle I had with myself to have the match applied. I gave the word, and in a moment the eastern end of the old crossing was in a whirl of flame and smoke. That retreat to Baltimore had as many varying experience as the men making it. Colonel Seward made his escape upon a mule, using his silk pocket handkerchief as a guiding reins, and rejoined what was left of the regiment at Ellicott Mills the following day. It became an almost go-as-you-please race. Had not Bradley Johnson and his men had been otherwise employed, and not had McCausland's followers needed rest, many more of our forces had been captured than were. The regiment that had been detained at Monrovia fell in behind, and to some extent covered the retreat. The attack of early upon Washington cannot be called part of the Monoxy fight, yet it fits as perfectly as fork fits a knife. While the 3rd Division of the 6th Corps is falling back from Monocacy, our comrades of the 1st and 2nd Divisions under Wright himself are making a dusty march by night to City Point, and there take transport at once for Washington. It's after 2 p.m. on the 11th that they disembark at the foot of 6th Street and thereby bring comfort and consolation to the terror-stricken population of that city. President Lincoln greets the boys as they touch the shore and familiarly breaks a hardtack with them. It's the old six corps, the refrain, as they march up 7th Street. Constantine of old drew no more inspiration from this sight of the cross in heaven than did these people on seeing the Greek cross in which the red and white told of victories great. Though the six had participated in many bloody engagements, perhaps no incident in its history gave it more glory than its opportune arrival here. It became the fortune to fight under the eyes of the president himself, and to effectually complete what the bearers of the Blue Cross had so valiantly begun three days before at Monocacy. Later on, Alfred Rowe continues with his narrative. It's fitting in this narrative to note what others have said of Monocacy of those who fought there. The report of General J.B. Gordon on the Confederate government, among other things, says, I desire in this connection to state a fact of which I was an eyewitness, and which for its rare occurrence, and the evidence it affords of the 
sanguinarity character of the struggle. I consider worthy of official mention. One portion of the enemy's second line extended along a branch from which he was driven, leaving many dead and wounded in the water and on the banks. This position in turn was occupied by a portion of Ewell's brigade in the attack on the enemy's third line. So profuse was the flow of blood from the killed and wounded of both these forces, it reddened the stream for more than a hundred yards below. It has not been my fortune to observe on any battlefield a more commendable spirit and courage that was exhibited on this by both officers and men. He fixes the loss as 698 men and extols Colonel J.H. Lamar and Lieutenant Colonel Van Valkenburg, both of the 61st Georgia and both slain. The mortality among the officers on both sides is noticeable. Doubtless, they afforded excellent marks for the sharpshooters. General Wallace's report it would have been a difficult task to say too much in praise of the veterans who made this fight. For the reputation and for the truth's sake, I wish it distinctly understood that though the appearance of the enemy's fourth line of battle made their ultimate defeat certain, they were not whooped. On the contrary, they were fighting steadily in unbroken front when I ordered their retirement, all the shame of which, if shame there was, is mine, not theirs. The nine regiments enumerated as those participating in the action represented but 3,350 men, of whom over 1,600 were missing three days after, killed, wounded, or prisoners lost on the field. The fact speaks for itself. Monocacy on their flags cannot be a word of dishonor. Rowe continues and talks about the town of Frederick. As to the place... We had little time to consider our surroundings, though the various clod in our midst realized that we were in paradise as compared with the sand desolation of Petersburg and vicinity. Still, there were those of us who the day before in passing through Frederick had said, This is Barbara Fritchie's town, and many questioning glance was cast at attic windows, wondering if we saw the one whence, with a royal will, the grand old patriot had flung out the Union flag. At that time, the denials of subsequent days were unknown, and the fame of Mrs. Mary A. Quantrell had not dawned. We knew Whittier's words, but few, if any, knew what we passed by Dame Barbara's house, that we had been close to the porch whence, in her love of cleanliness, she had driven tobacco users of both armies, and that, within stone's throw, her body was lying in the quiet Lutheran burial ground of Frederick. Stonewall, long had ceased from his raids and death nearly two years before, had taken Barbara from earthly turmoil, but were still fighting for the flag she loved so well. Then, to in the public cemetery, Mount Olivet, a humble stone proclaimed the last resting place of him who wrote, O oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming. The son of a revolutionary officer, born in Frederick, Francis Scott Key had immortalized himself in the words of the Star-Spangled Banner, inspired by the British bombardment of Fort McHenry in 1814. Since January 1843, he had slept the sleep that knows no waking. Twenty-four years later, Rowe visited the battlefield once again and says, When we were ready to erect a memorial, there would be no trouble about the site. Brothers, now the day is ended, vanished in the surge of time. But the monument is still in the future. Is it ever to be there? It's not the time near at hand, when from the prairies of Illinois, from Ohio, from the green hills of Vermont, from loyal New Jersey, from the Empire State, from Pennsylvania, and from Maryland, my Maryland, shall gather the survivors of those who fought and perished here, to dedicate on this consecrated ground a towering shaft on which shall be written those words of our commander, General Wallace, in his report to the War Department. These men died to save the national capital, and they did save it.